the meeting to order. Uh, good evening. We'll, uh, we'll start with a quick review of uh, minutes of prior meetings, and we have, uh, we have two meetings. We have January 7th and January 14th, so why don't we do them in, uh, in chronological order. So we'll start with the January 7th meetings, minutes, and then go to the January 14th. So we'll take a minute. Oh, Susan, you, uh, where's your folder? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Oh, Liz, can you pass it? <coughs> Thank you. We'll get it done. Uh, do we have a motion relative to the January 14th? Um, seven. January 7th meetings, thank you. Oh, we need a little time. Motion to approve. Do we have, do we have a second? I'll second that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Okay, so we've approved the January 7th meeting minutes, and we'll take a look at the January 14th meeting minutes.
we have a motion uh, relative to the minutes of January 14th? So moved. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain. Okay. All right, so the, we have approval of the January 14th minutes. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. May I have a uh, su suggestion that we can get the minutes ahead of time? I'd save some dead time. Sure. So if we can get them emailed to us ahead of time, that would be a grateful thing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so today we have uh, presentations from school, IT, and facilities. Um, I will defer to the presenters as to which order they'd like to go in. Uh, and we're ready to hear you when you're ready to talk. about the facility master plan. I know we covered it with the last time I was here, but if you have any more specific questions relative to the facility master plan, I'll also talk briefly about the town IT uh, request of $50,000, which has been a standing item for the last several years. I'll stand in for Matt. Uh, Matt Killen has moved on to become the IT director for the city of Salem. Uh, he left us, um, his last day was last week. Matt's been a fantastic asset for the community. He's taking on a role, actually once contemplated by North Andover, a combined role where he's overseeing both the school and the city uh, IT uh, functions, something that they had not had in the past. So uh, we wish him well. Uh, he's meant a lot to us in terms of advancing our technology um, and a lot that we see today and how we operate as a function of, of Matt's fingerprints in many ways and certainly appreciate uh, the time I had the, as I mentioned, as he was leaving, I saw Matt 2.0. I had the great pleasure of working with Matt a decade earlier in the city of Chelsea and, and when I came to work here, it was really neat to, to see a friendly face. Not that you're all now not uh, friendly and familiar, but it was pretty neat and, and to know um, that in the area of technology to have someone that you're familiar and comfortable with. It was uh, particularly important for me, so we wish him well. Uh, as relates to the facility master plan, I talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago. It is the plan first uh, contemplated in 2010, approved by the 2012 uh, town meeting. The F facility master plan committee uh, came together with the help of a consultant, a group, uh, a firm called Cecil Group, and rolled out a multi-year, eight to 10 year plan affecting uh, several municipal and school buildings. And uh, the goal of the committee, or sort of post-committee, was to take the $25 million in expenditure improvements that were the basis of programmatic deficiencies and align those with debt service as it was rolling off our books to make sure we could afford the facility master plan without the need for a debt exclusion override. And that was really the goal or the centerpiece of the program. I think it made it easier for our uh, town meeting to accept, uh, not having to ask for additional dollars or affect the capital plan in an adverse way. You may recall for those folks who have either were at town meeting or on this group, our commitment to town meeting was that every year we would come back and ask for the next year's funding. So the first year design, the next year construction, next year design, the next year construction. And we've followed through with that commitment to town meeting each and every year. We've seen the success of uh, the first project, which was the Kittredge Gymnasium, which is a fantastic project currently in operation. Uh, the second project was the school uh, central administration building. It's nearing completion. It will be done substantially complete in April of this year. It will be occupied um, later on in the spring and early into the summer. So we'll so we'll leave a 1,600 Osgood and stop paying rent um, there. Uh, next up, and we've begun the construction of a new central fire station along uh, Route 125 at the corner of Prescott Street. That construction is underway. We expect a substantial completion by October. And we've begun the redesign of the space next door and really the programmatic redesign of this entire building here to find uh, the best way to use all of these spaces and to bring back the community development offices. Uh, what you'll see when the project is complete uh, is really a new central town hall as opposed to two individual buildings uh, foreshadowing a likely entrance change where there's a center to the building and the ability for residents, customers, business owners to go and, and receive all of their services in one general area, which would be neat, uh, attracting uh, business owners and residents to Main Street to encourage business development here as well. So we continue on track with that. Uh, it should be noted that the gymnasium, I think, was 50000 over budget. The school administration is, is approximately 50000 under budget. And the fire station project will be several hundred thousand dollars under budget when complete. Um, 
we're in the ground, and for those of you who are familiar with public construction or any construction, really getting in the ground um, and making sure that you have a platform to construct above is the most critical time in terms of possible change orders. Uh, the fire station project is in the ground, the slab has been poured, uh, the subsurface in infrastructure is currently being completed, and there have been no change orders on that project uh, to date. And that is really when you would logically expect it, because especially on a, a new build, new construction. So um, in aggregate, uh, the facility master plan uh, approaching nearly uh, close to $10 million in construction is on time and under budget. And next up on the project will be for the construction dollars associated with developing this building and also the design for improvements at the DPW facility. As I mentioned at the last session, we uh, altered the original methodology really because of the condition of the DPW facility and a request by the school administration and support, uh, supported by the school committee that they needed one more year to understand what the needs were for the school classroom expansion. And so by moving public works up, we're addressing an immediate need uh, and allowing the school department to come back with a recommendation of what they propose uh, next year as part of uh, the classroom piece. And so uh, we feel, I, I can tell you, as we communicate this project, myself, my staff, uh, selectmen have communicated this project, this concept uh, to others in the region and beyond. It is remarkably well received. Uh, too often we in public government produce plans and put them on a shelf and, and pull them down occasionally. And this is one of these uh, really true successes in that we, with a lot of support, including you folks, have developed a plan and we're implementing that plan. And, and doing it in a way that's efficient and effective, uh, which is really positive. I can tell you that the company that worked with us has asked us to speak to other communities about the success of our plan, so very proud to say that this plan is working and working well, um, and certainly will answer any questions you have relative to the plan. Just a comment on time, on our budget is pretty good. So far, the last few years, anticipated that question I was going to ask. Um, you also mentioned in the last few times about when you plan on updating sort of you're not going to wait 10 years and then start fresh. Can you describe some of your plans relative to keeping the capital plan uh, fresh and current? Sure. Uh, well, there's several items within the capital plan now that really address ongoing items, meaning our ability. So the facility master plan addressed what I would have defined as programmatic deficiencies, areas where, for whatever reason, the facility no longer met the need of whatever the program. Program, in our terms, means is it is can it perform the functions we expect of it? Can this surf, serve as a town hall, as an example? Uh, and so the facility master plan really addressed largely programmatic need, in some cases, space constraint. So Kitchener Gym is a great example, right? So <coughs> programmatic need was there wasn't one, and so we needed to fill that need. Uh, the capital plan has several different examples of, of uh, adding dollars where none existed in terms of ongoing maintenance. So. Um, it can be everything from technology, and we can segue to that, to some of the other maintenance projects that are that are in the plan. So if you look at um, facilities maintenance as an example, we've requested for the last couple of years and request again this year $150,000 on an ongoing basis in the capital plan to address uh, ongoing maintenance related issues or issues large enough to deserve replacement that are not part of things you'd find in a budget. Um, Mr. Foster, who's a facility director, will speak to, to some of those and some of the general ideas of, of what we um, expect to happen over the next 12 months. That is new. I know for you folks it's not, but for the residents at home, uh, before two years ago, we didn't put regular dollars into a category called facilities. We waited for a department or some kind of stakeholder to say, hey, it's broken, we need to fix it. And not that that didn't happen, by the way, but uh, in terms of regular dollars committed in some regard that we uh, provide the latitude to the facilities department to dedicate, um, that's new. Uh, IT in a similar fashion, uh, you notice, uh, and I can segue to that because I'm going to speak to IT. Uh, on the town IT side, we've added $50,000 in every year of the capital plan. Uh, and this floor alone, if you looked at the uh, technology-related assets, this, this space, any of the offices on this floor, I uh, pretty quickly realize that we're operating with a substantial amount of information technology infrastructure, everything from desktop computers to wireless routers to the stuff behind the walls. And, and so it's important that every year we invest in some level of either preventive maintenance or replacement plan on technology. And so the decision a couple of years ago was to add a standing item in the capital plan. So the 50000 that gets placed is not going to solve, if we have a major 
IT issue. It's not solving that. What it's doing is saying, hey, we don't want to look five years after the fact, look back and say, hey, by the way, we need a quarter million dollars to catch up because we didn't keep pace. So every year we use that $50,000 to change uh, light infrastructure like wireless routers, desktop computers, some of our more portable devices, and in some cases more network related, not as common, things like firewalls and and switches and those kind of things. Those are typically left for larger expenditure <coughs> category. So by, by having a placeholder in the capital plan uh, for both IT and facility, um, we are keeping pace while at the same time jump-starting our investment in facilities with something like the facility master plan. And finally, later in the capital plan, you've noticed we've had a placeholder for facility master plan too. Really our uh, decision to say, Whoever decided to look at the facilities was a fantastic idea, but if we wait again as long as we waited originally, then the costs will be higher and the issues more severe. So I can't tell you what's gonna be in facility master plan two or whether there's necessarily a need, but it seems logical there would be. And so uh, setting aside <coughs> dollars to bring a company back in to work with staff to come up with another five, seven, or 10 year plan seems logical, and we've placed that in the out years of the capital plan uh, to foreshadow our, our expectation that we'll need another phase of these more significant improvements. Would that include uh, schools, Andrew? I think it would. Yeah. I think this, in this case, uh, again, the schools were included in the first round, but, the, but I, to a certain extent, I think um, the question was, did, what did really people expect from this plan? I think probably initially, they weren't sure if we would get, you know, get off the ground to get funded. So um, yes, it'll include uh, looking at a whole bunch of facilities. We need to distinguish of the difference between facility and programmatic improvement and, progr and, and facility replacement. And, and so the facility at master plan that I, if it ends up being facility master plan two, it will always be about uh, improving the existing facilities. Um, and so I would foreshadow that would be a review of the schools and review of other buildings. I think I've identified uh, something like, you know, using on the public side, maybe the, the, uh, the other fire station by that point would be 40, 50 years old. Do we need, how, you know, what kind of improvements do we need? Other, other school deficiencies we need to address from a programmatic perspective. So on the reconfiguration of the town hall, there'll be, have to be some work done here as well to incorporate next door. Uh, we're still working through the design phase, but I would expect that. It, not substantial, not, um, I think there will be some reconfiguration to make sure sp uh, adjacencies are created, to make sure there's a proper alignment of the program. And I would, that's all part of the existing budget, so it's not an ad. Uh, we've been, I think, uh, in addition to Mr. Tirshaw's comment about being on time and on budget, that's a budget that hasn't changed since first proposed by our engineering uh, firm in 2011. And so we're, uh, what we said to the Finance Committee last year and to the selectmen and to the town meeting is we'll need to start to look at those numbers in the context of inflation because we've been very successful at taking a plan first developed in 2011, approved by town meeting in 2012, and only requesting what that plan said, and now we're going to be three fiscal years later, uh, which is good news, but, but at some point we'll have to reflect. I wouldn't expect any major changes, but the amount requested for town hall is the amount originally contemplated back in 2012, and we feel very comfortable about our ability to pull that project off, including any reconfiguration on, on the existing side. Uh, you, know, you mentioned that there's the $50,000 fund for IT and the $150,000 fund available for maintenance, uh, that we've had that a couple of years. Yep. So have, have those been completely used each year? And if yeah, not, yeah. Um, what what have we done with the sure. rest of the funds? So Steve can talk to the facilities one because he'll speak more intelligent than I will to that. Um, uh, and I'm not wordsmithing, but they're not funds, they're appropriations. The difference between those appropriations and a general fund is that they can carry from one year to the next. There's some importance to us that that happen because sometimes in terms of ex expending dollars, w we can't get to the end of the year and be fully expended. If it's a capital item as proposed in the plan, it then can get carried to the next year. So if we do, don't fully expend those. As it relates to the IT, they're, they're fully or close to fully, like sub $5,000 uh, expended, fully expended uh, on the IT side because 
because we can consume them pretty quickly. We're sensitive, or the departments are particularly sensitive to make sure that they are spent. It's not uncommon in capital line items, however, that uh, because there isn't a sensitivity to that June 30th gauntlet, that they're um, smarter about making sure that they reserve just a bit so that if there's another issue that arises, they have those available. They don't have that flexibility on budgetary dollars. So even if it's pay-go, pay-as-you-go capital within the operating budget, we're going to spend those dollars pretty aggressively because they're, they're lost or turned back. Uh, on the capital items, we use that little bit of flexibility to make sure that if something were to happen in May or June, uh, or, or late June into July, we have the dollars available to address that. But they're substantially being spent, meaning uh, smaller dollars available from one year to the next. Uh, Steve can talk about it a little bit, but um, uh, using the facility example, and again, Steve, Steve can provide more detail, we have a balance on last year's 150000 uh, but a, let's say in the 50000 the $60,000 range, that actually is being coupled with this year's request to do uh, the non-historic roof at the library. So the ability to be able to carry that because Steve's been focused on other things and, and has left this unspent currently, with the current dollars we're request, requesting this year will allow Steve to address um, the, the, f the flat roof, the roller roof, the non-historic roof at the library by coupling those dollars that you don't have the advantage of when you're dealing with an operating budget because when June 30th comes, sweeps away and we start again. Good, thank you. Yeah, because I was wondering too if that was the proper amount, but it sounds like it's yeah. worked out fine so far. Mm -hmm. Well, it is the combination of, uh, it's, it, it's really a simple but really great question, and here's why. Because if the amount was 250000 for technology and 500000 for facilities, it sounds like we could do, I didn't do the math in my head, but it sounds like we do four or five times more. And I would say to you that, and I've, I've said it to finance committees in the past, we're balancing the need for dollars to do the right work and the human resources necessary to make sure the work gets done. Municipal work isn't like other work. The requirements to go through the bidding process, identify contractors, complete the work is more complicated. And because it's more complicated, there are limits to how fast we can spend the money. And it, Taxpayers are probably happy to hear that, but it, it, it can be particularly complicated in the areas of information technology and facilities, especially facilities, where the method of bidding and procurement is complicated. So um, I would say the amounts represent a balance between our needs and our ability to fulfill those needs in any particular area, because what we don't want to do is uh, leave dollars on the table that are two and three years old. We wanted the ability to say that if we're requesting a capital item from you, you should expect we're going to spend it in about 18 months. Shouldn't expect 12, like an operating budget, but you should reasonably expect we're going to fully expend those dollars within 18 months. And if we're not spending it fast enough to spend it in 18 months, then we're actually asking for too much. And I would say that even if we double the facility amount, we wouldn't be able to spend that in 18 months, or, or probably two years. Well, we hope we don't have that many small uh, maintenance issues that need to be addressed each year anyway. So, I mean, 150000 that sounds good, and that's probably the amount that we're able to spend as well. As you say, the procurement yeah. part is hard to do. I would say the need is a little greater. I, I would say the need is higher than 150, but our ability to spend is 150. I mean, if you're given the nature and the dynamic nature of our facilities, how many facilities that Steve is uh, responsible for uh, managing, I would say that the number is, um, the number could be higher, but our ability to spend, uh, our capability of spending the dollars certainly is not higher. And I hope someday is to be able to come back and ask for a higher amount when we're capable of managing that in a way uh, which makes it more efficient. Thank you. I have a, a similar question. So the, uh, Facilities master plan, it's, it, it's really it's this big project and takes a lot of time and, and, and effort uh, and also takes a lot of resources away from other capital projects. Is there anything which is now deferred because that, you know, the four million last year or this year, you know, you, you would like to do, but you really can't do it because that four million is really clocking, uh, you know, on a, on a yeah. you know, more water treatment. Sure. Through, uh, no, I, I think it's a reasonable, I would say as it relates to those projects, although the dollar values are higher, 
Um, they're somewhat self-contained projects, mm -hmm. meaning once we get, there's going to be an architect and an owner's project manager in each of those projects, short of the, the gymnasium project, because anytime you're over $1.5 million in spending in a municipal project, you must hire an owner's project manager, someone who represents us, an owner's rep, someone who doesn't rep the, uh, represent <coughs> the architect or the construction company. Uh, their involvement in the way we've aligned our organization so um, allows us to handle those projects even though they're four million and three million. Uh, in some ways, Steve could probably weigh into this, in some ways more effectively than some of the $50,000 projects, which requires Steve to write a spec, make sure the spec is accurate, get bids back, evaluate those bids. Um, the, 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 the investment on some of these bigger projects is actually um, it's, it's more time, but on a do dollar for dollar basis, it's actually a little easier to manage. Because once we're done, we have an owner's project manager, and we have an architect, and we've got a project, and we've got, uh, so those can be a little easier to manage um, on a dollar for dollar basis than some of the smaller projects. Yeah, I mean, also from a funding perspective. I mean, a facility master's plan takes away some funding, you know, even in the outer years. Yeah. Uh, was there anything that got, got dropped? Because it's just yeah. that plan is there, and you know, we're going to yeah. go through? Well, it goes back to the question that was asked uh, by Susan. So if we put X amount of million dollars back into the project, we have the ability to spend those, and that should be spent on a thoughtful plan. So my answer to you is no, because uh, you make choices through the plan, and the plan thought out what the other obligations were. If we don't implement the plan, then we don't address the programmatic deficiencies. This is all about um, allocation of scarce resources, right? That's what it is. So you have choices to make. The choice made, and I think rightfully so by town meetings and boards of selectmen and other finance committee was, these programmatic deficiencies represented a more important um, interest than what the similar dollars could have been spent on. Not operational, because these are capital versus operational dollars. So as it relates to one-time expenditure, that was the proper allocation. What we try to do is balance, balance the larger programmatic things with those other ongoing items and not put all of the dollars into the larger programmatic or all of the dollars into the preventive maintenance, but try to find a proper balance. And I think that's what the capital plan, reasonably, you know, reasonably, there certainly could be folks who could argue dollars either way, I understand that, but does a reasonable job of looking at everything from larger programmatic need, facility master plan, to ongoing maintenance, IT, and facilities, to uh, some larger replacement projects like the school uh, athletic facilities, uh, to rolling stock and other equipment purchases. So again, we're, we're dealing with allocating limited resources, and what we try to do is balance that across the spectrum of opportunities to create a, a reasonable outcome. Uh, but I'm not sure there's a magic formula to make it ideal. But we haven't viewed the facility master plan as taking away from things. We've, we've viewed it as addressing concerns. In the case of the Kittredge Gym, as an example, a 50-year-old concern that had never been addressed. Um, in the case of um, any number of the projects, uh, the DPW facility, probably a deferred issue for a decade plus that we just otherwise didn't find a way to fund. Right, and, and certainly the, the way the plan is balanced the capital needs and reduced the need, <coughs> excuse me, to go for, for debt exclusions uh, has made it more, I think, more palatable and there's been uh, less acrimony in town than perhaps. You know, I was at the meeting with the $10 million police station, which was, uh, you know, rejected. And it does seem to, um, to make things work a lot more smoothly. So certainly the planning um, and the foresight is, you know, is great. So. Yeah, it, using that example, which is a great one, I, the, the, the fire station, which is in the current plan, the fire station was contemplated as early as the late 18, uh, 1980s. <laughs> Wow, that was a long discussion. Uh, the 1980s and then seriously contemplated in the early 1990s and again in the late 1990s. And, and it was the nature of the plan, the fact that it was not just about one building but a sort of a comprehensive system-wide look and the fact that it was funded in the way it did that made it a reality. And, and so um, you certainly could argue for some sacrifices within that, but it made, it made seven projects possible. And not a lot of communities adopt seven projects um, within a system. Typically it's, do you have enough votes to get to that first project and then we get to the next project and we end up picking those projects which have the votes rather than view the community from a holistic perspective. I think that's, it seems simple because of the work 
everybody's done on it, but it really is unusual because typically uh, you apply the leverage where you have it, and if you know you have the leverage to get something done, that's the project that gets done, even if it otherwise wouldn't be first on the list. And from our perspective, this was prioritizing the projects based upon a particular methodology and recognizing that we um, you were looking for the entire you know, plan to be implemented. I remember two years ago at town meeting, um, I'll forget the person's name, but someone who had been very involved and very involved in the schools uh, stood up and said, uh, we bought into this plan. We want this plan the way it's presented, and we buy into the plan. And it was the second year, not the first year. And it, and it struck me because it, it, it was a recognition by those folks who had attended uh, town meeting the previous year that, that it was really neat to look at things holistically and not one project at a time. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, Steve, you can talk about the 150000 a year for our facilities. It probably is a good segue to do that, if that makes sense. Sure. Good evening. A few new faces. My name's Steve Foster, Facilities Director. Uh, I'll say hello to the new faces here and just talk about $150,000 going into uh, FY16. As Andrew mentioned, uh, part of my budget, 50% uh, uh, of it rather, is uh, going to be dedicated to the library flat roof replacement. Uh, coupled with some funding from this current fiscal year, we'll make up that project uh, budget. And we're currently uh, interviewing designers for reviewing that roof system, getting it designed. It is in definite need of replacement. I have wrestled with that roof for about two years or so. Uh, tried repairs, the re repairs haven't worked, and we're gonna go for a new roof because water's coming in the building. We have collections in danger, so earmark most of my money, 50% of it, on that single project, as I mentioned. Steve? Excuse uh -huh. me. On the library roof, there's a historical part of it and a non-historical part mm -hmm. of it. So general fund money, or, or the, uh, general fund money would, or your budget money would be used for the non, um, uh, historical part and maybe some uh, Community Preservation Act money, uh, perhaps, if it's approved, would be used for the other part. Would you be having the same, uh, when, when you put it out to bid, would, would, do you think you'd be having the same companies doing both the same, uh, uh, both parts of the roof? One company, both parts of the roof, historical, non-historical. Uh, based on the low bidder, I, I couldn't make that determination. Mm -hmm. uh, usually in, in the construction business, you'll find certain roofers specialized in certain roof systems, mm -hmm. flat roof specialists, and there might be clay tile specialists, which is the more historical roof. I wouldn't expect the same roofer, based on that specialty uh, analysis I did, to have the same project be awarded both projects, mm -hmm. but the bidding process will, will bear that out. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, 50% uh, of the project going to the library. The balance of it, uh, the remaining, is probably an 80-20 split based on mechanical system repairs, replacement uh, during the year, and about uh, uh, the remaining 20% being on other building envelope matters that come up, major roof repairs and so forth. Is that current roof, Steve, on the uh, non-historic side of it? Does that <coughs> tar and gravel, or is it torched down? Or? It's... Uh, an, EPDM, which is called a rubber roof. It is a terms. rubber roof. Yes. Yeah. Really? It's about it? uh, 20 years old, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's seen its day. Uh, really? Acknowledged by several uh, roofers and also the roof uh, specialists I've had up there. Yeah. Uh, there is wet insulation. We've done several cores. There are several identified wet areas below the membrane, which is not good news for the building structure. And I don't want to incur any rusted members no. below the deck or, nor uh, any uh, other mold intrusion, so things like that. it only lasted 20 years, a rubber roof? Yeah, that's about the lifespan of it. Really? Yep. Mm -hmm. Are there new materials being made for roofs? I mean, this uh, that's fairly old technology, uh, the rubber roofs, uh, and they don't last. Um, uh, the rubber roof is still out there. It is the low-cost alternative of roof systems. You'll find uh, more systems out there that are more, uh, durable, more durable than that and uh, more uh, user-friendly in terms of foot traffic and yeah. repairmen being up there dropping sharp yeah. things. 
So I'd be looking to have a more durable system put up there that would give me some protection from that kind of failure in the future. I noticed the Atkins, Atkins school roof is going to is up for replacement in a few years, uh, and it also has one of those membrane roofs on it. Right. And I was wondering what the, when I looked at it, what the life expectancy was. And now you're you're telling me it's what. 18, 20 years be in the for 20 this year technology. Area. Yep. Well, it'll be interesting to see what the difference in cost would be with um, with the uh, better um, material. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. yeah. Flat roofs are tough. Yeah. They are. Yeah. They have all kinds of problems with flat roofs. Any other questions? Steve, how much, I think it was implied there was some f fiscal year 15 money that was also going to be used to uh, help with the library roof? Yes. How much f do you anticipate coming out of fiscal year? Uh, approximately 75000 So it's about a $150,000 project for the roof itself? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And Steve, um, how is the building automation, what's the status of building automation around the um, town? When you say automation, are uh, the, uh, like the BM energy building management, management system? systems, energy and controls and so forth. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a web-based system that can be accessed anywhere you can grab a signal. And I can tell you with uh, one person on my staff being Greg Roberts, he manages that with his uh, portable tablet device. And uh, anywhere he is, he can get a phone call and look into the problem, weigh in on it, uh, triage it, if you will, and uh, be ahead of the, the problem by the time he hits the, the location. In terms of controlling your temperatures and schedules, uh, it is fantastic because now the schedules are all set. There's no need to turn on boilers, turn off boilers, uh, wrestle <coughs> with thermostats in every room. It's all automated. Mm -hmm. And so the control over it allows you to save a lot of energy. You're not seeing the thermostat left on overnight. Mm -hmm. You're having that optimum start system implement the heat exactly when it's needed to bring it up to temperature when your work day or school day starts. Uh, turn it off at night, so uh, it's fantastic. Uh, best thing uh, we've had in this time in terms of energy management, it's it's a really good system. Does that system involve an annual licensing fee of some sort for access to the web that controls it? How does that? How does the licensing uh, work in the technology? There's no uh, uh, licensing fee I'm aware of. It will mm -hmm. main need maintenance in terms of possible upgraded Upgrade. software and so forth as, as we go forward, mm -hmm. uh, but no licensing that I'm aware of. Okay, so it sits somewhere, the management system sits on a server and we just connect to it through the web is what you're saying. Right. It yes. sits on a on a server that belongs to the right. town. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a licensing fee for software mm -hmm. yeah, and maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. That's so. handled for the IT budget. Yeah. We okay. consolidate most of our okay. within the IT operating budget we deal licenses or the annual you know, fees associated with maintaining. When you replace uh, any of the equipment, are you looking at uh, to replace it with an Energy Star rated? Uh, Whenever possible, yeah. yes. Uh, case in point, we've done some hot water heaters at the school's large commercial type. Mm -hmm. And I <coughs> look for that Energy Star label first off. It's going to buy me the efficiency down the road. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit of a premium you pay for it, but in the years forward, if you can efficient, have energy efficiency, you're paying that back in a short few years. And the other thing, uh, speaking of the hot water heaters, we've, we've right-sized them because there's a lesser hot water demand in all your schools now. You know, there's not as much uh, dish cleaning in the, in the kitchens anymore and the showers are infrequently used. So you can downsize them. You don't have to have the big boiler keeping that water hot anymore. So uh, yes, we do buy that uh, when, the, when, the, when the price is right, yeah. Do you look into solar systems at all? I'm leaving that in Andrew's court. I think he's, he's been talking to solar, and so I'll let him speak to that. Uh, we do have an array in the high school right now that's uh, more of a, like a 3.5 or so uh, size system. That was more of a starter kit, I think. Uh, I think Andrew's talking with a bigger system, and I'll let him elaborate on that. Just for curiosity's sake, you say that you replaced some of the hot water heaters. Did you look at the on-demand hot water heating at all? Well, for the size we need, it, it wasn't practical. Uh, we looked for the most efficient, brought in the vendors to evaluate different options, and it, it just it wasn't on the table. If there were a smaller point of view, say uh, low demand, we'd consider that, and we may look at that at a few instances in the future. 
but just a little bit too big for this. And then, um, Stephen, how do the how do the departments utilize you in preparing their um, capital requests for the following year? So, do you get called up by different groups to come out and evaluate and, and look and offer guidance? I do. Uh, it's kind of a two-way street. Uh, they might call me to evaluate something, look at something, give me my rec uh, give me recommendations for what they're considering. Uh, the other thing I do is I'm continuously going through the buildings, uh, reviewing, inspecting. Uh, take notice of things, make recommendations to Andrew and Jim about things that would need replacing in the future, prioritize it, give them a, it's next year, a year after, or it's right now kind of thing. So it's a continuous basis. Uh, meet every month on these things with those individuals to look at these projects going forward so we have a good eye on what's happening down the road. We, we have a working committee um, of senior staff officials, school and town, that, that meet to evaluate where we are on capital projects uh, on a monthly basis. So we track our own um, success, so lack thereof. If there are areas where we, um, if, if there are areas, so we ask departments, we have an internal process, this is operational, uh, where we ask departments to uh, provide us information as to the status of all capital projects. And then we evaluate that feedback to try to determine whether or not we feel like it's tracking consistently with our expectations. And as we have a working group of senior staff, which is where I begin the conversation, that evaluate that kind of feedback from department and division heads and decide from there whether we believe we need to push back, not meeting milestones, not going to make that sort of 18-month frame I spoke about. So we have... Uh, processes by which we evaluate our own performance internally to make sure we're completing the tasks that we've requested funding for. Question for Steve, and this isn't really directed at Mr. Mailer, but is there anything that you wish you could have? That's really the you had a drop because of priorities or because of more hours in the day. <laughs> <laughs> no, relative to the capital requirements. Well, I, I think Andrew probably stated it right. Uh, you know, the department's small now; we're growing, and I think f f it's probably properly funded right now. Are the things you'd like to in the future? Yeah. Uh, can I see in future years that budget growing? Yes. But again, we're taking baby steps here, and I think we're in three years come a long way from where we are and I think the facilities are looking a lot better. So again, I support the growth. I think it's reasonable growth. If there's something that I think we really need, I would bring it up to one of these individuals to review it with them and support me on it. So in that case, you'd hear from me if that would happen. Okay. Steve has probably heard this, but because uh, I've mentioned it to it in our regular meetings, is for us, we view uh, facilities at this point as assessment, assessment, assessment. Um, we're still in that assessment mode. We've been in the assessment mode since Steve arrived a couple of years ago. We're going to continue to be in the assessment mode. We have too many buildings, too many moving parts to sort of be at the next phase, which is a managing construction projects or, or the kind of implementation. We need to continue to assess our facilities and, and develop such a handle about what's going on with them that uh, we will become ultimately more efficient. But we're several years, we're, we're certainly still in that assessment phase and will continue to be in the assessment phase for, for several years. It takes that long, uh, given the commitment we've made to and the staffing we've applied to it. So um, some of that is material and documents and literal assessments by engineers, and some of it is uh, Steve's de Steve developing a knowledge of, of the buildings, walking around those buildings, understanding how they operate. And believe it or not, they, I know you all know, they all have individual personalities as it relates to this one has its own special personality. but. Um, so we, Steve's focus is assessment, it really is, and, and will continue to be assessment for uh, certainly at least several more years. Uh, anything else for Mr. Foster? Steve? Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Steve. Thanks, Steve. Next victim. <laughs> okay. Hey, Jim. Hi, my name is Jim Mealy. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations for the School Department. Nice to be here tonight. Um, two of the most difficult aspects of my job are the unknown and the unexpected. And coincidentally, the two gentlemen here tonight um, have made my job a lot easier in that regard. Steve 
uh, with regard to the unknown. Um, it's easy to not know what's going on in, in the buildings, especially in the, the guts of the buildings. Um, and since Steve has come on board, I felt a lot more confident in the condition of our buildings. You're always wondering if a boil is ready to go or um, the windows are um, weatherized enough, um, that your systems are working properly. And as Steve talked about, uh, we do a, at least a couple times a year an assessment where one time a year we'll meet to uh, go over each building and plan what we're going to do for the summer to get it re back ready for school again in the fall. And the other time is to get ready for our submittal of our CIP requests. Um, what do we need and, and what kind of condition are our buildings? Um, so we have a much better handle on that. And we're actually in pretty good shape. We were able to leverage a few years ago um, MSDA money uh, to do a re-roof of the middle school, re-roof of the sergeant school, and then practically the whole exterior of the Atkinson school where we replaced that whole window system. Um, uh, so those buildings are in much better shape. And really, when you look at our request, you'll see the Atkinson roof that was mentioned earlier is the one item right now that is a identified need. But other than that, we're in pretty good shape, and I feel a lot more, a lot better about that. And now with all of the Amoresco work that's been done, um, we're in very good shape. And then regarding the unexpected, um, Andrew Mailer has proven very understanding when we come to him and say things have changed and allowed us to move within the plan, always trying to stay within the plan, but adjust things accordingly. And a good example of that is we had the, um, 2004 was when the high school was built, and that meant that the two athletic fields, the sport turf fields, and the track are that old. Um, they've held up very well, probably better than anticipated, but it's getting close to time to replace. We thought we had an extra year on the track, but as it turns out, I walked the track last year with uh, the original engineer and found out we need to do it this coming summer if we want to keep it and not have to put too much into it. So we were, Andrew allowed us to move that request up a year. And by the same token, we moved a request uh, back and that was the uh, part of the facilities master plan, the, um, what's listed as classrooms. It's based on three variables. We've got enrollment projections that we're working on and what do we need for space. Um, it's based on our portables. Uh, our portables have held up pretty well and we did kind of revamp them last year to get us about four or five years more of life out of them, uh, but not much more than that. And then just kind of space needs. Andrew mentioned the Kittredge Gym. Uh, the one remaining school is our largest elementary school um, that lacks a true gym, and that's Franklin. So all of those we need to take into account, and that's why we asked for an extra year to figure out exactly what we want to do based on enrollment projections that makes the most sense to meet the needs of our students. Um, so that's been critical for us. As far as what you see in our, our capital requests, I, uh, just Gentleman Thomas Ringler, I haven't met you yet, but you were asking about what's getting deferred and somebody else asked about what's being put off. Um, really what ha has happened is functionally we're addressing our needs. The thing that gets put off, if anything does, is aesthetics. There are things that you'd like to do to look better. I'm not a big fan of carpet in schools, especially in corridors, and we have some and I like to replace it, but it can wait and those are the kind of things that we do put off because we need to. Um, but we have the track, we have the sport turf fields, which are going to be replaced. Um, we have the Atkinson roof, and then we have that part of the facilities master plan. The only other item we have is an annual amount. Don remembers when we did a lot of um, work on our infrastructure for IT in the school department. Um, that asset is probably worth about a million dollars right now between infrastructure and internet capacity. And so we have $100,000 in for the next few years and then we're going to ramp that up to $200,000 a year to maintain what we have. And that will put us on about a five year replacement cycle which is right where you want to be for that type of equipment. Jim, so those you, are our You You had, needs. Jim, a, um, a, a plan. Um, uh, for a hundred thousand dollars a year for five years. Yes. For the IT, is that available? D does that plan say what we're going to do each year? 
That is, it, there's not specifics. It's basically maintaining what we have. So oh. things will break down and need to be replaced. Like, like this year, they're going to what, replace? Whatever happens. Yep, there, we have infrastructure equipment, servers, routers, whatever they are, um, that on a million dollar asset that now, you know, it's four, it's starting on four years old, things start to give. So, like I said, if I've got a million dollar asset and I'm only doing $100,000 in main, maintenance per year, then that's kind of a 10 year replacement cycle and that's too long. And that's it's why we're- It's too long because things get basically they, outdated. They go earlier than they? that. Yeah, five yeah. years is a reasonable amount. I'm comfortable with that. Then everything and turns into a dinosaur. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so- Exactly. Yeah, uh, it, it, can I just add to that, that what they were doing, I'm trying to remember what Matt went over. As the more students got computers, they needed more access points. Ah, uh, yes. The number of sessions per yeah. access point, and it took me a while to get. And then, the, then there's a controller that controls the access points, and then it goes to the you know whatever routing to the backbone and stuff. So they would been at, every year they would put in this amount of money to keep adding computers, servers, uh, now wireless phones. access point. Now phones. Yeah, now for I mean, phones, tablets, whatever. But. So all of these things that need to, like the access points. Yeah, they all have yeah, Wi-Fi capability. Do, do they all get like prioritized like they really do in other parts of the budget? We need, you know, this unwired thing and a router here and all of that. Yeah, the, the I, parts. I should sit down and do yeah, that. Yeah, the parts aren't dissimilar to computers themselves in that if you have a four-year or five-year-old computer, you need to start thinking about replacing it. Um, yeah, it's, it's the same with the parts of the infrastructure. Well, clearly, and then, it, so anyway, you have a process in place where that actually gets down on a piece of paper yes. and someone says, we need to be yeah, we looking. We used to get that. What? We, at some point, we, I remember seeing that where the number of computers we're going to replace this yeah. year, mm -hmm. you know, number of access points we're going to add, sure. you know. I think Matt presented that. The, uh, uh, no. We I certainly see. can give you, right. you know, some of Matt's parting words, so, because yeah. um, I know that, that this would come up. Uh, through the investment we've made, uh, not through directly to that, but that we're network investment, we're currently at 500 megabits per second, I think is. Instead of 50. Instead of 50, which right. we were some years ago, uh, creating our ago. bandwidth to be, to be able to manage the fact that we are processing more data system-wide. Remember, we have one, let me step back because some of you folks are, are, again, new to the process. We have a single fiber backbone that connects all of our buildings, school and town. It runs our phone system. We have a single phone system that runs off that fiber backbone. We have redundancy built into that backbone. Uh, we've upgraded the system. I think at last count, we're operating between 50 and 60 percent of that capacity. And so it's our expectation <coughs> in the next couple of years, you know, 50 to 60 percent is good. You know, we don't want to push it too much further, but we'll need to start to change that infrastructure to stay ahead of that curve. One other item that Jim um, uh, didn't omit but didn't get brought up as a discussion was a pretty substantial amount of that 500,000 with the investments with the capital plan was specifically to the high school and providing the wireless capacity at the high school. Uh, there was a, oh. like a substantial investment in the high school to make sure that we had sufficient wireless routers and other technology to make sure that we could communicate. The high school is a 300,000 square foot brick building, not the easiest space to communicate with in a wireless environment. And so uh, there was um, you know, well into the six figures investment in that building alone to make sure that we had the capacity for students to be able to communicate and use Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, within that building. That was a substantial part, portion of that. And I, I may be able to pull out the relic of a document, and Sam may be able to reference it. Uh, I believe it was the school committee produced what I remember to be canary yellow, mm -hmm. and it was a five-year plan that identified a million-dollar investment in the schools, of which uh, they asked that the capital plan uh, take on about 500 and something thousand. That's what you have in front of you. Uh. And there was going to be private fundraising um, or some other methodology to supplement <coughs> another 100,000, which, which in fact the schools incorporated into their budget operating. this year. Mm -hmm. So there was 100,000 in the operating budget and each over the next five years, I assume the assumption is, mm -hmm. um, using some leases, which is, was something that the Finance Committee had talked about as a way for regular system replacement. And that was supplementing the 500,000 that you see in your capital plan under school IT. Mm -hmm. So that, that the plan was a nearly million dollar investment over uh, five years to make sure we caught up and then began to maintain 
uh, the school information technology infrastructure um, and desktop computing needs uh, for the next five to seven years. So the plan is to have the CIP continue to the maintenance of our infrastructure and internet capacity and in the operating budget try to keep supplementing each year that line item so that at some point we'll be able to uh, replace the annual computers that need to be replaced out of the operating budget. I think they're probably going to have to, Matt was mentioning, <clears throat> with all the stuff going on between the buildings and everything too, they may have to light up more fiber too. So that's going to, you know, those are going to be more expensive nodes that are going to have to be upgraded or you know, something in the back end of it and the pipeline going to the internet. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So. Okay. Content on the internet is just getting heavier and heavier, and there's really a certain amount, I guess, you know, you, you can sort of try to stay ahead of the curve, but, I mean, even looking at things like Khan Academy that all the kids are using now, I mean, that is such heavy content. It's all video content, so you need, you know, you got <coughs> a bunch of kids accessing that all at once. You can see where that must right. load and up pretty darn quickly. The last effort, um, the goal was with an eye towards um, possibly one-to-one -one, um, capacity. So that's mm -hmm. what we've built to. Uh, we're still contemplating what that's going to look like um, st starting at the high school. And when you do that, you have to build for two or three devices per student, not just one. Because yeah. um, as you say, they have a laptop, they have a handheld, they might have a phone as well. Um, so that's what we've built to it. Um, Jim, I, I went through the, the original facilities master plan kind of thinking about, you know, the, the million dollars that shifted from one year to the other. And, um, you know, perhaps it's better to talk about it another time. But it does seem like, you know, as I look through in the, in the spreadsheet, in the, in, in the spreadsheet contained as an appendix to the facilities master plan, it went through kind of each school and had kind of a, two different options for each and identified a number of kind of programmatic needs at the schools that was, that's, you know, substantial. Um, so I was just wondering if you're aiming towards, you know, doing some things in the next two or three years, you know, to what extent um, has this process started and how do you envision, you know, if you're thinking about it's going to take 18 months to get ready to ask for this money, how are you going to spend the next 18 months with it looks like, you know, some fairly big needs at the schools. Replacing portables seems to be, you know, not inexpensive at all. Um, so what's the, what's the game plan for the next 18 to 24 months? Yeah, and we've already started. Uh, the most important aspect being a, a very accurate enrollment projection model. Um, we need to know what to expect in the outgoing years because it may be that Right now, the projections are that we're going to level off and then even decrease, especially at the elementary level. And if that proves to be accurate, um, it may be that we could accommodate the replacement of the portables simply by removing them and moving right. those classes into the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, really the first step, and that's going to drive everything else. Uh, because like you said, we do need to address the portables. We probably need to address the uh, Franklin gym. And maybe if, if it works out that enrollment projections are like I've said they are, then we could address the Franklin um, gym similarly to the way we've addressed the Kittredge gym and the portable um, problem would be resolved uh, just by enrollment. Um, so we're working on that right now and we'll have a good idea of that in the next couple of months um, and be putting together the plan. Could I add to that that we had to put a title somewhere, I remember this discussion you and I had a couple of years ago. Um, so it says classroom. Because right. instead of saying schools, right, which would have been a really interesting conversation, right, or, or some other reference, the point was that we recognize, Jim recognized, and the folks involved in town, there was going to need to be an investment in some programmatic space. But we didn't know what the programmatic space was. So uh, if it helps, the title is less relevant than the content. And I would expect that Jim may come back, whatever the suggestion is by the school department, it may be gymnasium space or classroom space or whatever. We haven't changed the title, but I would get a little less caught up in the title, uh, not that it's your fault, because 
could be tied to this, mm -hmm. uh, and more in the fact that that is dollars available for programmatic space based on the priorities of the school department. Mm -hmm. and that's, that just didn't fit so many letters. <laughs> that, that's the intent. Mm -hmm. you, let me ask you this. So, you know, as we look around the schools and we look at facilities, and you say trying to um, make sure they're on par, make sure they're, uh, they meet the program needs and so forth. Have we done an analysis of each of the schools to see that that's really the case? And what I'm, what I'm thinking about is a school like the Kittredge, which is, you know, it, it's, it, let's just put it, it's, it's not quite in tune in terms of size and the way that's configured with some of the other schools. How does that, have we looked at that? And if we have, what's your, what's your take on it? Yeah, we did that. Um, <coughs> when I first started here, the kitchen was ready to be demolished, um, according to some people. I know that I was not here when it happened, but there was talk of a new elementary school, Foster Farms, I believe, was the project. Um, and in order to help uh, promote that, I think the Kittredge got a bad, bad rap for its condition. Um, so when I came on board, that had already been squashed, and so it was left to us to um, keep the Kittredge up and running. And you know, along with Steve, we've done the assessment, and that's why we decided to add the classrooms there. Uh, we added four classrooms through modular construction, and we've done the gym. And the kitchen is in very good shape now. There were some um, issues with the roof that have been resolved as well. Um, but yeah, we had those discussions, and, and it's solid now. Um, I, I had to uh, explain that it was solid because we had to justify, in order to add the classrooms, we had to install a sprinkler system in it. Why are we installing a sprinkler system in a building if it's not going to be here much longer? Well, we believe it will be. So we do have those kind of discussions. You guys were thinking about facilities master plan too. Uh, and uh, what kind of surprise might await us, you know, uh, as far as schools? Yeah. It seems like we're gonna defer off some of it, right? Yeah, just looking at them, um, again, working closely with Steve, uh, they're in pretty good shape. Uh, we don't anticipate right now the need to replace a building. Uh, that's certainly not anticipated to be part of step two of the master plan. And then the other thing I noticed, kind of compare, going through the last couple of years of facility um, of the CapEx ranking, was that um, for in FY14, there was a, an item, you know, further out in 2018 for sprinklers at Franklin and Atkinson. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's kind of fallen off. Um, I don't think it was part of the master, it wasn't part of the master plan. No, it's an item we had. Uh, they, those, <coughs> we had three schools at the time that were not sprinklered. Kittredge was also one, Kittredge, Franklin, and um, Atkinson. And it's not required um, unless you're going to add to the building, okay. and then it's required, and that's why we had to do Kittredge. So we had it out there, it kept getting kind of pushed back, and you, you mentioned a million dollars, which was originally the amount that had been set aside for the classroom, as it was titled, um, project, it's now at a million and a half, and what we did was we took one of those items and reallocated it for needs that were identified for paving, um, masonry work, things like that, and then the other one we, we added to this project. So that if we do have to go and add to either the Atkinson or Franklin as a project, we'd have the funds for sprinkler okay. as well. So it's like a 20% increase in capacity and you have to put sprinklers in. It, it used to be, and now it's, All you add anything, you've got to sprinkler the building. We ran into that with the Kittredge modulus because we're thinking, oh, we're gonna be below 7,500 square feet, and nope, they had just changed the rule and you had to sprinkler the whole building. Okay. Sounds good. Any other questions? Thanks for your time. No, thank you. Okay, Thanks, thank you. Who's next, Stan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should talk about your car, Stan. <laughs> okay. It's open mic night. <laughs> okay. Um, 
we're going to skip item C. And uh, is there any new business? Our next meeting is on uh, February 4th. And uh, I know we're going to have, I just had the schedule out and I seem to have misplaced it again. Uh, but it's continued CIP, I, I believe. Okay. Let me, actually, I have it. With well, the miscellaneous computer. departments? Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah, let me. Yeah, that's what it says on the schedule. Yeah, so, right. Wednesday, February the 4th, uh, wrap up CIP. So, any questions? I would just. Um, urge the committee members, if you have any questions um, between now and then, you know, that you would want someone to, to answer. Um, you, know, you can't have a discussion over email, but you could ask for a, uh, a clarification or additional information to be provided at the February 4th uh, meeting. And that could be done either um, in writing. Someone could reply in writing, and we could have the reply and read it aloud, or, or we could you know, discuss it, or they could, they could show up. So. Um, we would like to um, put that this segment of the of the budget um, to rest on February fourth. So it's an important uh, important meeting. Is Joe Coco and those guys coming in? Or? Okay, so there's no they don't have any capital items. Uh, okay. Now the senior center has a request for an automobile, transportation or something. It wouldn't be within the capital plan. We submitted a request. All right, I, I just wanted to get clarification on that, Andrew. That's there sometimes we receive questions. Right. We triage and decide that if it's going to be, well, we set that standard at It was below 000. capital requirement. Below right? the capital requirement. Well, the capital, the, it's the self-imposed capital requirement of 50,000. Right. So it's below that. So we'll, we'll evaluate that in the context of the operating budget and decide okay. whether we'll include uh, it or not. All right, not. okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, maybe I have one thing um, for, for that meeting on February 4 when we close up the well sure. capital mm -hmm. uh, budget um, I mean that the funding or the debt you know level going forward you know it, the main main drive of that is our CIP budget you know how much you know, we spend and how much of that we need to borrow the net borrowings based on the, on the capital plan um, and I, I looked through a couple of budgets in the previous years I would just also be before I can you know agree on a capital plan just to understand you know, where we are today with the debt level and where this continues out in the next five years based on that capital plan and just, a, you know, directionally, if we could, you know, combine that and, and just and see where, uh, where we stand in five years with this, with this capital plan. So you have the current five years and then right. you'd want five more years rolled out after that? Well, you see, in the current five years, our, you know, debt, the retirement, you know, yes. based on current debt level. Correct. But I don't see... You know what are we gonna? I know what we're gonna add no, it, well, each what's, year, but that, but then that has a schedule. You know, you know, right. you'll retire in the, in the second year. You you start to retiring, and and and, and overall, uh, sure. you know, an overlay of uh, the new capital spending and what that does to our yes. net borrowing. We have we have um, uh, debt schedules that go for the full life of however long any of the requests we've made are. So, the plan you have does incorporate the current requests for the five-year period. Those are incorporated, but we continue those debt service schedules out until the expiration of the bonds. We certainly can provide those. Mm -hmm. yep. Is that you something know where we could see? Hmm? Is that something that we could see? Can Lynn press a button on the, it's, on it's the not computer easy. and um, sprint it? You know, well, we we, we absolutely maintain full debt service schedules on every bond issue that that we have ever issued. Mm. So if it's a 20-year bond, we, and it compounds to show what's geo debt, uh, geo debt on a general fund basis, geo debt on you know, water and sewer enterprise funds, how it travels, so that we, we absolutely have debt schedules for, yeah. and then we have debt schedules that we're assuming based upon that capital plan. Yes. Uh, and yeah, and, and um, you know, I went through all that. There's a lot of information, but now you have to consolidate. You know, what is the top line number? And in my yeah. guess, and then maybe I'm completely wrong. You know, while we reduced the debt over the last ten years significantly, I mean, we we're almost at 100 million or something. You know, close to. Um, yeah, and, some of that school debt. And now it moves down to more like 50 million, including enterprises. Yep. And it seems like we're gonna get stuck at that 50 million level. 
uh, going out with the and, and I was just trying to understand that a little bit more in detail. Maybe we can have we will have a discussion it, next on, sure. on February uh, 4. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to be ready to have a full debt service discussion on February 4. That's that's a if we're going to get into a debt schedule, I, I'm certainly can, and I'm not being defensive about it. It's just that's a it depends on what level of discussion you want to have about uh, debt service and. Every business, well, most businesses, and I can certainly say municipal governments, will always carry a level of debt. The significant decline in our case is a combination of rolled off uh, capital debt and a substantial amount of debt excluded as a function of the high school. Mm -hmm. So we're getting closer to the point in which the high school, so the bigger decline, that 100 to 50, and I don't have it in front of me, but well, yeah. I assume you're correct, the 100 million to the 50 million is is largely driven by taking a 54, 56 million dollar high school mm -hmm. and rolling that off. Mm -hmm. But the revenue for that, to pay those bonds, comes out of this taxpayer's pocket as opposed to this yeah. taxpayer's yeah. pocket. And so when, when that debt service rolls off, it doesn't create capacity within the debt service created by capital projects, it, it, it results in a decrease in the amount that taxpayers pay specifically for that project. Um, so we will always carry a level of debt service. We certainly can get into a discussion on what that level should be. Uh, what we don't include when we give you those percentages is we don't include you the, any debt that is excluded from the levy as a function of being a vote of the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So that 5%, 4%, those kind of things. But mm -hmm. any debt schedule you want, we have full debt schedules for every bond we've issued. We have assumed the impact of the debt of borrowing those dollars that are in the capital plan. Mm -hmm. In fact, we define for you whether we think it's five-year debt, 10-year debt, 20-year debt. Last year, uh, Ms. Blake asked, um, are, are, is this what is our average life of debt, I think we talked about. Mm -hmm. We're able to provide you a short schedule which said, that the average life of our debt is actually less than it appears on the page. So we pay our debt faster than um, we're required to. So if it says 20 year debt on that, there are times we can actually borrow for 15 years rather than 20 to try to pay off our debt quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and we've provided you that data in the past and I'm more than happy to provide you with as much uh, debt service um, and funding schedule information if you'd like. It's, it's great. To, to see that some folks have an interest in reading that. Um, and so we'll provide that. But, I, but in terms of a deeper debts uh, discussion, um, we can certainly begin it on the fourth. I think it would be complicated to get from sort of beginning to end on it. But we'll provide you all the debt ser service schedules you'd like mm -hmm. about projects already borrowed and those projects we were requested as well. More than happy to do that. It's just a giant spreadsheet. Yeah. <laughs> really giant spreadsheet. <laughs> well, you know, so you know, so you're not surprised when I ask for that on February 4. So I'm asking. No, I'm today, going to get you the debt you know? schedule, service <laughs> schedule in advance. Yes, I will. Yes, I will not be surprised when you ask me. Yep. But we contemplate that when we request items that we're looking at, not just the five years, but the impact as it trails as time goes on. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not a perfect science. Our financial reserve policies talk about a four to six percent debt range. Um, we have tried to force the nut in the short term to stay at 5%. The policies actually talk 4 to 6%. Mm. And we exclude things like schools because they have the tendency to make a $50 million debt load look like a $100 million debt load. And, and it, it can skew okay, the picture, yeah, it can yeah, skew no, the, no, picture no. the other way. No, no. Uh, but we're, as a philosophy, we will always carry a portion of pay go, I mean a portion of what we do will be paid out of the operating budget. And a portion will always be a level of debt service because as a tax-free municipal bond, when you're paying 300 basis points for a cost of capital, you know, whatever, whatever you're paying, which is fairly inexpensive, mm -hmm. it makes sense for us to carry a portion of what we do as debt as opposed to just operating capital. And it goes to the equity question because some residents would say, if you pay as you go all that you do, then you're making me pay 100% of the cost of what happens in a community, even if that investment has a 20-year impact. So if we're investing in a building for 20 years, how come I'm paying 100% of that and future generations aren't paying their share of that cost? So as a philosophy, there'll always be a portion of what we do that is debt service driven. We just try to keep it between that 4 and 6% thresholds. We don't see any new excluded debt coming up. I, I'm not recommending a new, any, any new excluded debt. That's for others to, I've been very consistent. It, that's a community-wide discussion of which 
I will never recommend excluded debt. That's for other people to deal with. But we'll forward along the, the, the uh, debt service schedules. Yeah, also, where's the, your vision? You know, where, where you think is actually an, a, a good debt level, you know, mm -hmm. going out? I, I think 4 to 6 percent is very, very reasonable. The real challenge will be that if the cost of capital dramatically changes, yeah. which at some point, uh, I keep on saying it's going to change, but I've been surprised. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm one of those people with an adjustable mortgage and it's paid off, right? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> paid off, not paid off, paid off in the sense it was the right move, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I've assumed it's going to change for many years and it hasn't changed. The challenge for every community, and we're not alone, is we need to be flexible enough to realize that if the cost of capital dramatically changes, mm -hmm. then if we're going to stay in the 4 to 6 percent range, which is reasonable, mm -hmm. we're going to get less work done. Mm -hmm. So part of the benefit of things like facility master plans and investment in the infrastructure that we're making today <coughs> is that if that cost of capital would dramatically change and, and our borrowing costs go up dramatically, I'm going to come back if I'm going to stay within that 4 to 6 percent, and I'm going to say to you, See that five and six and seven million dollars a year we're spending? Cut that in half, and all of a sudden it'll be become uh, more difficult uh, for us to do meaningful long-term investment in our project in our in our infrastructure because we won't be able to afford it. Because I, I'm, the plan I provide you will never um, will will it's highly unlikely the plan I'll ever provide you will exceed that four to six percent range because then we're impacting the operating budget. Mm -hmm. But if the cost of capital changes, then then uh, bets are off on a whole bunch of things. Yeah. Uh, it takes a maybe it takes another couple of years, but when it comes, it comes fast and quick. Yeah. It's that is yeah, the thing. It's yeah. a very fair point. Yeah. And from our perspective, well, we only go out into the marketplace once a year. You know, if we miss that, then then there's a real there's a real cost yeah. associated with yeah. that. It's it's the benefit of a uh, capital stabilization fund where we're taking existing reserves and putting it in to ways in which we can pay for capital. Uh, on an ongoing basis as opposed to just financing everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, you know, we, the world can change, as we know, and, and hopefully it won't change for a while, but if, if we see a, a big increase in the cost of capital, then, mm -hmm. then it's going to impact our plans moving forward. Yeah, when municipal bonds start paying, you know, 6 percent again, yeah. I'll be buying <laughs> so, so we like our plan. We try not to alter it much. But if next year it goes 3% to 6%, it's not the same plan you have in front of you. Right. And I think we just we need to know that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not yeah. the same plan. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Are we going to look at item number two? The We're going to table that for okay. uh, another time. We just wondering, because you prepare right. so well. And I just wanted to make sure that we weren't overlooking something. No. Okay, is there anything else? Right, do we have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, great.